Greetings to everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning or maybe evening uh, in your time zone. Uh, so in order to arrange our seminar smoothly, we propose a couple of rules. First of all, we ask you to uh, keep your microphones and videos off uh, and you will be able to switch on your microphones. And there are two preferred ways uh, to ask questions. You can either raise your hand pressing the button uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the software uh, or you can type your question. In this case, we will read it in the chat uh, and the speaker will be able to answer. So, uh, our today's speaker is Professor Alexei Kimmel from Radboud University of Nijmegen, uh, the Netherlands. So, just a few, few facts from the biography. So, in 1997, Alexei graduated from St. Petersburg State Electrotechnical University, Leti. Uh, until 2002, he was a PhD student uh, at Joffe Institute, St. Petersburg. Uh, in, two, uh, in 2002, Alexei moved uh, as a postdoc to, to Radboud University uh, uh, after becoming an assistant and associate professor. Since 2017, Alexei is holding the position of full professor. So today, Alexei will be talking about ultra-fast emergence of ferromagnetism and their head spectroscopy of ferrum radite. Alexei, please. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation. This is a new experience uh, for me. I wonder how it will go. And very kind introduction. Indeed, it's a uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, at least virtually in, in St. Petersburg right now, so that we can uh, discuss and uh, share the results of our recent studies. So I decided to talk today about uh, things with which we are only trying to publish, and these are. Uh, uh, probably not that hot things in the terms of uh, science in the whole world, but this is something hot in, in our lab right now, and then we are trying to understand what's going on in iron rhodium. And uh, well, for the uh, those who doesn't know what uh, this, uh, why this material interesting, and then for instance, why we need to study ultra fast magnetism, why in iron rhodium, why terahertz, I'm going to give a short introduction to these uh, topics. And uh, uh, the main core of my talk, uh, the main results in my talk will be dedicated to the problem of ultra-fast spectroscopy of iron rhodium. And then at the end of the talk, I would like to show our, the most recent results uh, uh, about study of spin dynamics of iron rhodium in high magnetic fields, using magnetic fields up to 25 Tesla from High Field Magnetic Laboratory in uh, Nijmegen. Uh, well, why ultra-fast? Uh, that just if you want to, uh, well, if we want to understand why ultra-fast magnetism is interesting, uh, that we can have a look at the magnetism in general. So as we know, all uh, know that uh, although magnetism is known from uh, for centuries, from ancient times, breakthrough and understanding of physics of magnetism came only with the development of quantum mechanics, when it was realized that electron has spin and uh, over, there is a quantum mechanical interaction between the electrons and uh, which uh, uh, which is basically quantum mechanical uh, correction to Coulomb interaction and uh, this interaction is spin dependent uh, people started to talk about uh, uh, the, the uh, people separated the spin dependent part of the Coulomb interaction and started to talk about exchange interaction uh, finding very um, nice expression for this a very simple expression for this is just a scalar product of two spins and exchange constant J meaning that Two uh, electrons with arbitrary orientation of spins have different energy than two electrons spins of each are aligned. And here, depending on the sign of the exchange constant, we can have two big uh, classes of magnetically ordered materials in the world, uh, ferromagnets for which all the spins are pointing in one direction, and antiferromagnets where the minimum of energy corresponds to the situation when the spins are antiparallel one with respect to another. So, but this is quantum mechanical view at the, at the problem of magnetism. I also like to repeat that uh, magnetism is the strongest quantum mechanical phenomenon of, at this planet. Uh, if you want to understand quantum, uh, if you want to understand magnetism, you have to uh, apply the knowledge of quantum mechanics. Nevertheless, in 20th century, uh, a lot of things have been understood about magnetism due to uh, so-called macrospin approximation, due to transition from quantum mechanics due to ability to make a transition from quantum mechanics to classical mechanics, uh, 
we can use our intuition and understanding of uh, physical phenomena in magnetically ordered materials. And this uh, transition is called a macro spin approximation. So macro spin approximation means that instead of uh, considering ensemble of uh, quantum mechanical particles with uh, quantum mechanical interactions between them, we, uh, instead of considering ensemble of spins, we just sum up all the spins over the whole sample dividing by uh, volume and we will get macro spin magnetization in case of ferromagnets and antiferromagnetic vector in case of an antiferromagnet. So this big object like magnetization and antiferromagnetic vector uh, because they are big, these are classical objects, and then in this way we have a transition from quantum mechanics to classical physics where our intuition is strong. It all works fine, but now if you look at the, uh, at the characteristic times of the exchange interaction, which I would define as a precession uh, uh, period of, uh, the, uh, of uh, spin in effective magnetic field of uh, the neighbors, uh, then uh, how to calculate this period, you basically take the energy of the exchange interaction between the spins, the derivative of this energy with respect to spin and calculate effective magnetic field with which spin acts on its neighbors. And this effective magnetic field taken realistic energies of the exchange interaction be from 100 to 1000 Tesla. So that's why uh, quantum, uh, that's why magnetism is basically the uh, strongest quantum mechanical phenomenon uh, at the Earth. And if you, took, uh, if you take these uh, magnetic fields and uh, calculate the period of Larmor precession of uh, spin in these fields, then you, you will get times from three, uh, 30 femtoseconds to 300 femtoseconds. And uh, now, if you uh, start to think about uh, spin dynamics, keeping in mind that characteristic time of the exchange interaction is between 30 to 300 femtoseconds, uh, then you can see that if you consider spin dynamics on time scales much larger than the characteristic time of the exchange interaction, then you can use indeed macro spin approximation. Assuming that all the spins are pointing in one direction and the exchange interaction that uh, brings them all together is much stronger than anything else in the sample. However, if you reduce the time scale further and further, eventually characteristic time in your uh, problem becomes comparable with the characteristic time of the exchange interaction, as I, once again, this is more precession of spin in the exchange fields, then strictly speaking, you cannot apply macro spin approximation. So the problem becomes uh, um, uh, quantum mechanical again. And uh, you ha we have to search for new approximations here. We have to uh, find how to uh, simplify problems uh, otherwise. And if you apply uh, our intuition of classical worlds to this, uh, to this range, and there are plenty of examples in ultrafast magnetism where you can uh, arrive to rather counterintuitive conclusions. Another way to look at ultrafast magnetism is to uh, try is, is to look how uh, our theory of, ultra, uh, of magnetism in general these days relates to time scale. The these days uh, magnetism is uh, the theory of magnetism is predominantly based on uh, equilibrium thermodynamics, macro spin approximation, as I said already, an adiabatic approximation, many quantities of magnetism are defined in terms of equilibrium thermodynamics. But if you want to use equilibrium thermodynamics, you have to uh, make sure that the system is ready in uh, at least quasi-equilibrium state. So now, if you excite a medium with very intense, very short stimulus on time scale, say, 100 femtoseconds, you bring the medium into a strongly non-equilibrium state. And if, if you want to use uh, this conventional approach for the description of, uh, of a magnetic phenomena based on thermodynamics, you have to wait at least 100 picoseconds until the process of thermalization will be completed. And what we have now between 100 femtoseconds and 100 picoseconds, so I again like to repeat here that this is rather an explored territory in modern science. This is terra incognita of modern science, uh, which we would like to explore. And uh, this, uh, Really fundamental interest uh, comes uh, goes in step with the uh, interest of technology. Uh, magnetism and control of magnetism is directly relevant to magnetic recording technology, information processing technology, and uh, such examples uh, as a hard drive and magnetic random access memory. They operate, uh, they process one bit of information by reversing uh, spins. Uh, of, uh, of magnets, and if you look at the at the performance of nowadays uh, MRAM uh, devices, they, they become faster and faster. Of course, uh, electronics becomes faster and faster. Now they are ready 
but of reaching the limit of one nanosecond, maybe 100 picosecond, and it's absolutely not clear what we have here below 100 picoseconds. Whether we can expect that uh, the, uh, the devices would be faster than 100 picoseconds, then uh, whether, whether the uh, switching energy per bit will reduce, and in this way we, we can also contribute towards uh, uh, more energy efficient data processing, or will the uh, Will, 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 will we need uh, will it such that we will need uh, more energy uh, for faster processing information these are all questions these are all questions that are presently discussed in scientific society and in the, at the end of the day it all comes to the uh, to the fact that we know very little about this unexplored area of ultra fast magnetism about magnetism below 100 picoseconds well, maybe we will have uh, future technologies in this range, but our interest is uh, purely fundamental. Uh, at this moment, we would like to understand this unexplored territory, this terra incognita. And if we want to enter this terra incognita, of course, you have to have uh, means to excite spins at the time scale much faster than 100 picoseconds. And the mean that we have, uh, that we have chosen for our research is a laser pulse. So if you look uh, at the all stimuli that we have, uh, in experimental physics these days, uh, laser pulse, pulse would be probably the shortest one. So the laser pulse is even is maybe even the shortest ever man-made uh, event. So that's why we're going to use laser pulses to control magnetism and to explore this uh, unexplored uh, territory. So now this, I think this was uh, enough. Uh, I hope it was enough to introduce the field of ultra-fast magnetism and convince you that this is very. Uh, well, potentially very interesting area from fundamental point of view, but also uh, applications and, uh, are not that far away. And you can ask me, okay, why why iron rhodium? And here, I, I when when I have every, each time when I have to motivate uh, the uh, the research that we are doing, I uh, uh, remember my uh, one of the first experience of uh, uh, getting shock from uh, multicultural differences uh, was applying for uh, the work of, uh, best work of young scientists in the, the Yoff Institute, uh, I think it was already even 20 years ago, exactly 20 years ago. Uh, yes, uh, I see that there is a, uh, Alexandra Kalashnikov asked me a question about uh, uh, previous slides. Yes, let, let's come back to the previous slides. Ah, yes, uh, hi Alexei. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I have a just very general question about this uh, plot, uh, switching energy versus uh, time. Uh, this black line, where does it come from? This so black, yes, uh, black line, this consists actually of uh, two lines. Uh, uh, and then the, the, whole, the whole line is basically a combination of two. So there is a one law that operates on the time scale uh, faster than one nanosecond and another law that, that is expected on the time scale less than uh, one nanosecond. Here, the... Uh, the uh, uh, let me formulate it properly. The, so far, the mechanisms of switching in um, ma magnetic random access memories is is based on the motion of uh, on the, uh, of domain walls. And uh, in principle, this process, and if, especially if you reduce this, the length scale of the device, this process can become. It is not that long, so to say. It, it can it can occur. At the time scale of one nanoseconds, uh, then th that's why while reducing the uh, uh, the length of the, the duration of the pulse, to actually dissipate less energy. So that's the uh, because duration of the pulse of the uh, of the electrical uh, electric field pulse, electric current uh, pulse is shorter. But then, uh, since the process is, uh, occurs in a time scale of one nanosecond, further reduction of the, uh, of the, of the pulse duration uh, does not, uh, well, if you reduce it further, the process of monetization uh, reversal is not completed during the pulse duration, so it means you have to increase intensity of the pulse to switch it with such a short pulse. So it means that, that in the end that you have to put more energy into the into the system okay thank you yeah so this is how roughly how it works mm -hmm. but it's uh this 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 is not uh just one law <laughs> these are two laws uh here and then actually in this review uh we we explained uh, 
uh, were referred to the papers where the, these laws were emphasized. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Thanks. Okay. So coming back to, uh, to my story from 20 years ago, why I on rhodium. So every each time when I uh, when I have to motivate uh, research we're doing, I remember uh, when I was applying for the work of uh, uh, the best work of young scientists at the uh, at the Yoff Institute, and of course it's uh, over the whole physics. And I spent uh, quite some time explaining why second harmonic generation is so interesting, why nonlinear optical properties are so interesting, in particular paying attention to the uh, unique property of the second harmonic to be sensitive to interfaces and, sur and surfaces, just a few monolayers. And I, I, it was a shocking experience when uh, somebody from uh, Fusion uh, studying uh, process in Tokamak simply told they, they studied uh, uh, a specific modes in the, in, the, uh, in plasma and the only motivation they said uh, the, the fact that this mode exists is interesting on itself. And they won. <laughs> So that say, since that time, I always remember that probably I should say uh, existence of material like uh, iron rhodium is interesting on itself. And then uh, still, I would like to m motivate the choice that we did. Uh, why I find this material fascinating is uh, it has very unique, uh, I would even say, say outstanding Manetta structural phase transition, which eventually um, make us thinking about chicken and egg problem. It has a fa this material has phase transition from antiferromagnetic to ferromagnetic states upon temperature increase. So normally, our intuition expects that if you take a, a magnet, you increase temperature, you can only destroy magnetization. But here, if you take iron rhodium, it's room temperature, it doesn't have magnetization, but then you increase temperature, and eventually magnetization appears. So what happens here, it's a transition, phase transition from antiferromagnetic to ferromagnetic state. Uh, the phase transition not uh, th this that happens not only in magnetic system. If you look, if you uh, if you measure the conductivity, you see that uh, here the conductivity changes uh, suddenly at the temperature phase transition. People also observed that uh, 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 lattice of iron rhodium changes at the uh, temperature of phase transition. And also here you can see a confirmation of the fact that magnetization uh, increases upon a temperature increase. If you're sitting here, uh, upon temperature increase from 300 to 400 Kelvin. So what happens here actually, as I said, is a, is a, is a magnetostructural transition. So that uh, structure changes, uh, magnetism changes, electronic properties cha um, change, and if you put electrons, uh, lattice, uh, spins, if you represent them in terms of three reservoirs uh, with uh, connections uh, between them, and you look at this picture and you try to understand uh, how the phase transition uh, evolves, you start asking yourself, what does happen here actually? Does magnetism drive lattice in this case? So the first, trans first phase transition goes in lattice and then it takes magnetism together with that, or it's first uh, something happens with magnetism, and then magnet, uh, and then structural changes uh, follow. And then in this way, if you start to think about this problem, you eventually end up in the, in the chicken and egg problem, asking yourself what what's the first. And uh, just uh, as a little announcement, I think uh, our conclusion uh, at the end of the uh, of, of this uh, of the experiments that we have done so far is that uh, the problem is indeed very similar to chicken and egg problem. It doesn't have uh, such a simple answer. What is first? Uh, good. So then, this is my motivation for iron rhodium. If we didn't, and then uh, uh, if uh, uh, but we are not the only ones who were excited about this uh, material and the first experiments. Uh, which were performed, uh, they, 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 uh, uh, I think they dated already from nearly from 15 years ago. And a uh, nice thing about this material is that if you excite this with a, for instance, 100 femtosecond laser pulse. So 100 femtosecond laser pulse will uh, excite electrons in this material. Why electrons? Because uh, 
as we know, if it treats a light matter interaction in electrodipole approximation, we will be able to describe uh, most of the effects that which are observed in, in optics. So that's why we assume that light uh, interacts mainly with electrons, puts energy into electronic system. And then we can follow what's going on with uh, iron rhodium measuring either magnet optical effects, also optically, the visible spectral range measuring magnet optical care effect, or using uh, magnetic circular dichroism in X-ray spectral range, we can measure so-called XMCD. And we can also be sensitive to the latest changes uh, by measuring uh, uh, reflectivity. Simple reflectivity must be sensitive to the uh, latest expansion, and also X-ray diffraction can be uh, can be applied in this case. And as I said, the first experiments were done uh, quite some time ago in 2004. People applied a magnetic optical care effect uh, to measure uh, uh, dynamics of phase transition in this material. So here I show uh, dynamics of magnetic optical care effect for different fluences from four millijoule per square centimeter to 17. So you can see here while the increased fluence of the excitation so at low fluence, practically nothing happens. Then we see increase of the magnetic optical care effect, which was interpreted as an increase of the magnetization. And something interesting also happens in reflectivity here that reflectivity changes uh, these uh, measurements and then they analyzed how the reflectivity changes and they saw that in the reflectivity they have two contributions. One is very fast, which uh, looks very much as a contribution from hot electrons. The electrons first become hot in the materials and then they partly cool down due to spin, uh, uh, electron lattice uh, interaction. And next to this there is also a very slow increase uh, of something, and this very slow increase of something is an increase of uh, uh, of contribution from the uh, from the lattice in the reflectivity. So this is uh, uh, what we assign to uh, uh, lattice expansion. And if you put together rotation here with uh, uh, shown with black dots and reflectivity, which corresponds to the lattice expansion, you can see first that. Uh, care rotation has very fast jump, so something appears very fast, much faster than magnetostructural transition, then uh, my, my, then structural transition, sorry, then uh, structure uh, expands, and then uh, magnetism follows more or less uh, the uh, lattice expansion, but already on a longer time scale. So basically here we can, can from here we can conclude that first, femtosecond laser pulse triggers the phase transition, this is good news, uh, also, we can uh, count as good news that the fact that magnetic optical care effect and reflectivity can be monitored to uh, can be used to monitor the kinetics uh, of the phase transition. And the, the interesting findings were that reflecti while reflectivity reveals structural changes on time scale of 10 picoseconds, and the means characteristic time scale is about uh, 3 picoseconds. Uh, then uh, magnetic optical care effect shows first ultra fast emergence were uh, on a time scale much faster than 10 picoseconds, and then very slow growth on a time scale of 30 picoseconds. What happens further? Excuse yes. me. Yes. I'm a question. So, why does this uh, response, con uh, so concerns with lattice expansion, come from in the reflectivity? And what is the time scale? So, is it heating? Is it a refractive index change? And so why is it, does it look like this? Yes, thank you very much. That's a good, very good question. Uh, of course, reflectivity basically probes refractive index change. And if lattice expands, and lattice uh, the expands of, for about 1% in this, uh, in this material, uh, reflectivity should change upon lattice expansion. So where the time scale come from? Well, the time scale come from, from uh, the speed of sound times uh, thickness of the film. So this is the characteristic time for the lattice expansion. So the thinner the film, the faster this uh, reflectivity change will be observed. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I hope so. So that's kind of uh, standing acoustic wave, is it? No, it's not standing acoustic wave. It is, uh, it's not a wave already. So you put, just put a lot of energy uh -huh. into the system. You uh, launch uh, lattice expansion. So the density of atoms in the uh, in, in in the medium is uh, is less, and if the density reduces, refraction indi uh, index will also reduce. 
mm, okay by why why don't you have oscillations or something due to ah, this yes why, because it's uh because the, this is by far not i mean there must be oscillations of course if uh you should be able to observe oscillations if uh if these oscillations are not uh, damped so i think uh in um something like in the in in in, in x-ray diffraction people saw an onset of oscillations but i haven't seen oscillations in uh in optical measurements which is not which is still possible because uh uh because the oscillations can be heavily damped here in in, in the in the vicinity of uh, phase transition so there is also a comment from uh ivan that it's uh it's it's not a coherent process it's a diffusion so it's very relevant uh, comments it is uh it's what, what you can see here if you don't see relaxation if you see relaxation it's it's uh, more like uh, thermodynamic you can explain it in terms of uh quasi equilibrium thermodynamics so basically it's a heat transfer from uh from lattice from uh, from electrons to lattice and as a as a fact of the uh lattice uh, heating lattice expands uh, in principle, if you do this heat transfer much faster than the uh, characteristic, uh, than the period of uh, specific modes in the lattice, you can trigger coherent, coherent oscillations of this mode. Uh, well, I'm not sure that this mode should be on a time scale of 10 picoseconds. Still, I think that the, uh, or maybe, uh, well, the internal mode of thin film that can be but then another, another question if the oscillations of will not be damped uh, here so also alexander says that uh, oscillations related to phonons one needs sufficient penetration depth of light so also true uh, and also it should be i, I believe also qu uh, quite homogeneous situation because otherwise you will see uh, any homogeneities will contribute uh, similarly to homogeneous broadening Again, it would look like a heavily damped oscillation, even if it is there. Uh, nearly, uh, so, does Johan ask, uh, nearly near equilibrium magnetic elastic modes known, uh, near equilibrium magnetic elastic modes known in this material? This, I don't know. This we should, uh, we should check. I don't think that magnetic elastic properties of this material have been studied uh, time resolved. Uh, or by uh, also the spectroscopy, I haven't seen that uh, many works on that. Okay, so this is what so far we have uh, we had uh, in 2004, and uh, well, what happened further? Actually, it is uh, very interesting because uh, follow-up studies uh, can be divided into two groups. Uh, you could see here in the uh, the experiments, like as I, I showed right uh, now, you could see that uh, when you pump uh, iron rhodium with a short laser pulse, you first see an ultra fast increase of the magnetic optical care effect, which is interpreted as an ultra fast increase of the magnetization. And uh, consequently, it implies that uh, there is a very fast transition from antiferromagnetism to ferromagnetic state. Uh, interestingly, that when people performed similar measurements in X-ray spectral range, they didn't see this very fast increase of the magnetic optical signal, and uh, they only saw this very slow dynamics on a time scale of uh, 30 seconds. And of course, this is these are the studies in the visible spectral range. These are studies in the X-ray spectral range. Why may I ask? Why don't we use uh, perhertz? And uh, indeed, uh, we are we are not original people. Uh, started to think about possibilities uh, to use terahertz for the studies of ultra fast dynamics. How can we do this? There are two uh, there are two reasons why terahertz may help us to see uh, ultra fast emergence of uh, magnetization. And first uh, mechanism is based on magnetic dipole emission of terahertz uh, radiation. So if you have here an antiferromagnet, you pump with this with a short laser pulse. Imagine that antiferromagnet goes to ferromagnetic states on a time scale of one picosecond so it means that one picosecond suddenly there is a magnetization in the medium and this magnetization according to the wave equation will emit radiation and if magnetization 
appeared on a time scale of one picosecond, radiation would be in a terahertz spectral range. Also, uh, this uh, approach was first proposed by a group from Strasbourg, and then uh, uh, our PhD student, uh, Thomas Heusman, uh, formed uh, uh, the, the analysis of electromagnetic, uh, uh, of the, actually, he solved the electromagnetic problem and applied this uh, for description of, uh, of our experimental results. And uh, here you can, uh, indeed, uh, writing very carefully uh, boundary conditions and the wave equations show that uh, how to, uh, show how to relate the uh, electric field of the emitted terahertz radiation to the uh, induced magnetization. Then there is another approach suggested by uh, Tobias Kampfra that if you put platinum the, uh, uh, next to the uh, metallic uh, magnet and if you induce magnetization here in metallic magnet, if you change magnetization in metallic magnet, there would be uh, what, what, what you will actually do here upon transition from anti-ferromagnetic state to ferromagnetic state, you change uh, the energy potential for spin up and spin down. So it would mean that uh, the uh, spins with, uh, elect with uh, the electrons with spin down will uh, fly to uh, platinum. So at least there would be gradients of the potential energy from uh, uh, iron rhodium to platinum. And uh, electrons with the opposite spins will fly from platinum to iron rhodium, uh, such that total uh, 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 charge current uh, will be zero. So although total charge current is zero, the spin current is not zero. If you now take into account so-called inverse uh, Hall effects, inverse spin Hall effects, you will see that if spins are flying uh, in this direction, uh, then they will be scattered the uh, in platinum layer due to large spin orbit interaction uh, to the left and if they fly uh, in the opposite direction they will, uh, since the spin is opposite they will be scattered scattered the uh, to the very same uh, direction such that spin currents on this picture would be transformed would be converted into charge currents and as we know again if uh, this change of the magnetization uh, occurred uh, on this time scale of one picosecond, it will result in the picosecond pulse of electric currents. And uh, here, if if we have a picosecond pulse of electric currents, it will work as an uh, emitter of terahertz radiation as well, uh, but it would be emitter of electric dipole origin. So we have here two uh, sources, electric dipole source and magnetic dipole source, uh, and both sources will efficiently emit uh, terahertz radiation. And uh, how it works, it's very important uh, uh, point here I would like to, that I would like to emphasize. If you want to measure terahertz radiation, uh, then you have to use stroboscopic technique. Stroboscopic is a key word here. Uh, that we pump uh, our sample with a sequence of uh, pump pulses. And we, then, uh, these pump pulses uh, launch terahertz emission from the medium. And then steroid emission falls on the electro-optical signal, uh, so electro-optical uh, crystal. Uh, this steroid emission, the uh, electric field of the steroid wave induces uh, biofrigence in the, in the electro-optical crystal, which is then probed by uh, another uh, laser pulse, which we call pop pulse. So if this is a pump, and uh, then here I show the sequence of probe pulses before electro-optical crystal. As you can see here, the uh, uh, frequency repetition rate of pump pulses is uh, twice lower than the repetition rate of probe pulses. So what we do here, we practically compare the uh, probe pulse after the uh, electro-optical crystal when it arrives to the medium uh, together with pump and uh, without pump. And in this way, we can extract, can deduce electric fields of the terahertz uh, wave uh, emitted by the uh, by the sample under influence of femtosecond laser excitation. Very important that uh, in order to gain a reasonable signal to noise ratio, you have to repeat this experiment many times. So that's why the pulses they fly with a repetition rate 500 uh, hertz in the case of pump and one kilohertz in the case of uh, probe. So basically, every two milliseconds, we repeat this experiment, accumulate the data during several seconds, and you can see that 
and in this, uh, you will see that this way we can get decent signal to noise ratio, but the price for this, the price we have to pay uh, for this is that we can study this uh, process only if you make sure that the, after uh, each pump pulse sample arrives to the very same state. So basically we repeat the very same situation many times and relying on the knowledge that the, after the pump, we bring the sample to the very same state that we can excite this from the very same state again, that only in this case you can trust stroboscopic measurements. Oh, uh, again, so that people uh, realize that terahertz spectroscopy can uh, be very efficient and uh, ultra-fast uh, magnetometer. And the first work uh, published on this uh, topic, uh, again, came from uh, uh, from Camfer Group and in a big collaboration. I will come to this in a moment. And they saw indeed that there is a very fast uh, uh, contribution, the, uh, uh, there is a very fast increase of the magnetization in the medium, which is seen as a terahertz emission. So the pump, uh, iron rhodium with platinum on the top with the short laser pulse, and they saw that under the influence of this excitation, terahertz radiation is emitted. Well, terahertz emission is a signature of set picosecond second magnetization dynamics. And here, I think, uh, if you look now uh, what we have in this picture, we have uh, in the visible spectral range, people claiming that uh, there is a ultra fast increase of the magnetization. Here in the X-ray spectral range, people claim that there is no ultra fast increase of the magnetization. We come with the third technique, terahertz, uh, uh, terahertz uh, radiation, hoping that uh, finally this controversy will, will be resolved. I think, to be honest, I think this work has all uh, uh, features of, uh, of work for Nobel Prize, but for Nobel Prize for Peace, because these people, they combined uh, actually co-authors from the both camps, from uh, the camp that claim that there is ultra-fast uh, magnetization uh, induced in the medium, and there is uh, no ultra-fast magnetization induced in the medium, and most importantly, they succeeded to write it such that they don't contradict to the previous works uh, at all. So what they say, all that's true, that X-rays show that there is no ultra-fast magnetization increase and visible spectral range there is uh, ultra-fast magnetization increase, but the Hertz emission probes something else. So that's why we found that uh, it's a very good motivation to start uh, research in this direction. And we wanted to perform terahertz spectroscopy of iron rhodium. So we first, uh, uh, with, in collaboration with uh, uh, Shekhar Metapali and the group of uh, Eric Fullerton from San Diego, we obtained uh, high quality samples of iron rhodium capped with platinum, very similar to the, uh, to the experiments performed previously. Uh, here, well, uh, those who can read these uh, X-ray pictures uh, can, uh, well, can, can take it as information. For me, what is most important here is this hysteresis loop. Uh, this is uh, 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 dependence of the magnetization as a function of temperature. So you can see here that upon increase of the temperature, the magnetization increases. Then uh, you decrease the temperature, magnetization decreases, going nearly to zero. And uh, uh, because it's the first order phase transition, you see temperature hysteresis in this picture. Well. Uh, similarly to uh, uh, magnetization reversal, when you have uh, hysteresis uh, in the, uh, with respect in, in, the, in the magnetic field dependence of the magnetization, here you have hysteresis in temperature dependence of the magnetization, and the reason is, very, is, is, is the same in both cases. Because it's a first order phase transition in certain range, both phases, high temperature phase and low temperature phase can coexist, and uh, the hysteresis Appears. And the measurements we first performed with uh, were again very similar to those uh, performed by uh, Camfer Group and a big uh, group of collaborators. That uh, we increased temperature, decreased temperature, detected uh, terahertz emission from the material, and these are the traces uh, which were detected. And if you now compare the, uh, uh, the amplitude of the terahertz uh, of the electric field, uh, of the emitted terahertz radiation, and you plot this on temperature dependence, we see that temperature hysteresis actually doesn't show up in, uh, in a terahertz emission spectroscopy. Here with a dashed line, there is a temperature hysteresis measured with the help of 
vibrational uh, magnetometer, a vibrational magnetometer, and then here uh, the uh, uh, with uh, with triangulars we show the amplitude of the direct emission and the hysteresis disappear. This also, by the way, was uh, one of the uh, issues why group uh, of our colleagues uh, who studied this effect before claimed that there uh, that there are emission probes something else. Well. Uh, no temperature hysteresis and terahertz emission. Why? Let me uh, tell you, let me remind you where the hysteresis comes from. So if you have two phases, high temperature phase, low temperature phase, each of the phases here I will, I will represent by minimum of uh, on, on, on the profile of thermodynamic potential. The internal energy it could be free energy, doesn't matter in thermodynamics which thermodynamic potential you take. Then you increase temperature, you change the profile of thermodynamic potential. The temperature phase transition here, uh, you have uh, existence of phases. So it means there will be two minima for uh, thermodynamic potential. It means that the system can be either in one or another state. And in principle, these states can coexist. But then if you increase temperature, uh, starting from one minimum, this minimum becomes less and less uh, favorable energetically and eventually disappears such that the system should drop another minimum. So now if you start from one minimum, slowly increase temperature, you see that the system will drop another minimum to one temperature, let's call it T1. If you now decrease temperature, the system will stay in this new minimum and will drop another one at uh, lower temperature T2. That's why you have temperature hysteresis uh, in the measurements of magnetization as a function of temperature. Now we perform stroboscopic measurements. So imagine that we start from states uh, and uh, uh, we start on the cooling branch here. So this would be the states. Then we excite the medium with a short laser pulse change the th profile of uh, thermodynamic potential, the system will drop here. Uh, uh, well, well, the system will, uh, will be still here, by the way, in, the, in this old minimum, but if, if it was here, uh, it will drop uh, to the new minimum. Yes. Now, the cooling should, uh, should take place, because what actually happens to stroboscopic measurements, we repeat, heating and cooling again and again, an average of many uh, of many processes of heating and cooling of many cycles. So then cooling should take place and then in principle there's no guarantee that upon cooling system will stay the very same state or will drop to another state because as I said the, these two states they eventually they, they both correspond to the minimum of energy and we start from the um, uh, if we start from these states, it's not actually a very stable state here, but if you start from these states, uh, uh, again, there's a big chance to drop here down uh, to, 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 uh, to, another, uh, to another state. So in principle, if you come, uh, if, you, uh, if, you're on a, uh, if you heat it up and cool it down, the chance to, uh, for the system to show up to, to, to end up in one of these two states is, is not zero. And eventually, if the probability to get to this state and to this state is 50%, what you will measure, will measure something in between. You will not, you will not measure hysteresis, you will measure something in between of these hysteresis, and it means that hysteresis will disappear. So what actually means- question, that, excuse yes? me. Sasha? Ah, yes, uh, sorry for interruption. Uh, do I understand correctly that in this picture, if there will be a, like really long cooling time, then the, the hysteresis will show up again. Uh, very long cooling time, maybe, yes. Because like uh, the will have time to go from metastable state uh, to the uh, stable state. I would say very, uh, very long cooling time, and it, it would be the best if it is uh, cooling to the, uh, to the state, uh, to the, to the to temperature where second state doesn't exist. Oh, okay. So that's, you have, really have to restore. So imagine, imagine it's not temperature, imagine it's magnetic field. So you switch once with magnetic fields, uh, and then you want to restore initial state. So you have to apply magnetic field large enough uh, 
such that the second state doesn't exist anymore. You are not in temperature hysteresis, because mm -hmm. uh, in field hysteresis, because as long as you stay in field in, in whatever hysteresis, you have uncertainty about the state. It could be one of the two states where the system eventually relaxed to. Okay, right. Thank you. So if you're sitting here, if you can sit here infinitely long, in theory, mm -hmm. right? Uh, even okay. even though this state is uh, less energetically favorable, you really have to go here to make sure that you, re you re initialize uh, the initial state. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Good. So our conclusion is no hysteresis is expected here. And another very interesting and very important feature is that you, when you measure, when you study the kinetics of uh, first order phase transition, you have to keep into uh, in uh, you have to take into account that the phases uh, two phases will coexist and now uh, we come to uh, the most interesting feature the interesting part here is that uh, actually because two phases can coexist it's not very clear how to study kinetics of phase transition with stroboscopic measurements at all so in principle if you talk about phase transition from anti ferromagnet ferromagnet of course you pump this the short pulse, uh, you can trigger transition to ferromagnetic state, induce magnetization, and as a result of this uh, induced magnetization, we will have terahertz emission. You cannot exclude the, uh, the situation when there are already ferromagnetic nuclei in the medium, because they can exist there. You pump medium, and what you cause here, you cause an expansion of ferromagnetic nuclei. And as a result of expansion, there will be also terahertz radiation with the very same properties as here because they both originate from rapid increase of the magnetization. So how to distinguish between these two cases? And then in order to distinguish, we proposed, uh, uh, well, in principle, well-known double pump technique, but somehow people haven't realized yet that this uh, double pump technique can be helpful in studies of magnetic uh, uh, first order phase transitions. So what we do, we do double, we, we excite this material twice, use first pump, generate ferromagnetic nuclei, and we, use, we measure, we send the second pump to detect terahertz emission that comes only from the generated ferromagnetic nuclei. So like this, on, on this picture, we, uh, uh, there are nuclei of ferromagnetic uh, state here in the matrix. We pump with a short laser pulse, pump pulse. Imagine that, there is a, as, uh, that are, as a result of this excitation, we have uh, new nuclei appearing, and then other nuclei is expanded. Then we, got, we give the second pulse, and we, have, uh, and we trigger the expansion uh, uh, of, the, of the ferromagnetic nuclei, and as a result of the expansion, there is a terahertz emission here, and uh, what we do to get uh, information only about dynamics of these nuclei, which were generated by pump one, we detect signal, ter detect terahertz emission uh, from pump one, but on the repetition rate of pump two. Sorry, pump two. Again, sorry. We detect terahertz emission from pump two, but the repetition rate of pump one. Basically, we detect terahertz emission from pump two, which was affected by pump one. In this way, we exclude nuclei which were uh, uh, already in the medium before pump one from consideration. So the scheme detects only that part of the terahertz emission which depends on both pump pulses. So this is how the system looks like. Uh, you see two pump uh, um, uh, sequences of pump pulses at two different repetition rates, and then we detect only uh, the signal that uh, depends on the pump one and pump two together, and the signal is in the terahertz emission that comes after the pump two. So first, uh, there are no ferromagnetic nuclei, then pump one and use ferromagnetic nuclei, then we send pump two and detect, ter detect terahertz emission from the nuclei induced by pump one. Excuse, excuse me, we have a question from the audience. Yes? Uh, yes, uh, maybe a very naive question, question uh, from Johan. Uh, what if you simply pump very high with the first pump? Uh, what, what do you mean very high? Sorry. I mean, if, if, if you just 
a pump a lot, then I would expect that uh, you, most of the nuclei are just induced by the pump. Yes, but then we have to make sure that uh, with the next pump, we do the same. So that's we we the, the, all the all these uh, tricks uh, are uh, done to make sure that from pump to pump we uh, reproduce the very same situation. No, no so I uh, I think my question is more simple. I mean, if you just would have one pump, you would yes. also see just the uh, uh, growth of the light-induced nuclei if the light-induced nuclei dominate the pre-existing. Ah yes, that's that's true. Yes, if you pump very hard, that you can make sure that it, it dominates. Indeed, so it should it should be seen as a function of intensity at the end. Uh, but pre-existing nuclei will also respond to the pump. Don't yeah. forget this as well. Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So this was our uh, trick, and in this case, we don't measure terahertz emission already. We measure terahertz the ability of the nuclei to emit. Uh, uh, nuclei is generated by pump one meet terahertz emi uh, radiation. So we measure emissivity, terahertz emissivity of the nuclei generated by pump one. And this is the dynamics which we observed. And uh, so you see that emissivity varies very slowly. Emissivity changes as a function of temperature, 300, uh, 360 up to 420. What is confusing here in this picture that if you perform experiments uh, from uh, pumping the material from the sides of uh, uh, MGO uh, uh, substrate and from the sides of uh, platinum film, you will see different results. Well, at the end, it is not that surprising because, as I said already, there are two sources of electromagnetic radiation uh, in the medium. There is electric dipole source and magnetic dipole source. And these two, dipole, uh, these two sources, they have uh, different symmetry with respect to space inversion. So what you do here, turning the sample, practically do space inversion. And then if you look at this picture, my electric dipole, uh, uh, electric field of electric uh, dipole, dipole terahertz emission uh, does depend on the, uh, on the sides from which we pump the sample. And if you talk about terahertz uh, emission, magnetic dipole origin, you turn the sample around, and uh, of course, magnetization, the change of the magnetization induced by the pump will not change. So basically, performing experiments from both sides, we, uh, we uh, either have the situation when two sources will uh, interfere constructively or destructively. So based on this, we could extract the uh, electric dipole uh, the terahertz emissivity of electric dipole origin and magnetic dipole origin. So you can see here that in case of uh, experiments above the, free, uh, the temperature of phase transition, we have uh, a very fast decrease of the signal already, zero delay, and then slow recovery. It happens because, because it happens such because first pump pulse arrives, it's partly demagnetized medium. When the second pump pulse arrives, the medium is partly demagnetized. It's uh, demagnetized, so it can demagnetize less. And as a result of it, uh, uh, the terahertz emission uh, will be less intense. But while you separate two pump pulses from, from one from another, that you give medium more time to recover, and then there will be more and more uh, material to be demagnetized by pump two. And this way, you see here, fast decrease in the recovery, but this fast decrease in the recovery basically reproduces extra fast demonetization and recovery of ferromagnetic state. Then you decrease temperature and you can see here that this uh, negative part coming from demonetization slowly disappears and disappears together with the disappearance of ferromagnetic phase in iron rhodium and then positive contribution uh, appears and this positive contribution corresponds to the to the increase of the magnetization in in the medium, and uh, you can see here <clears throat> that the dynamics much slower. It's not it's nothing like ultra fast. It's on a time scale of hundred picoseconds in both cases. Well, uh, here we are still annoyed by the fact that we have uh, here contribution from ferromagnetic nuclei. The nuclei which were already present in the medium, and then they were uh, uh, affected by both pulses. By uh, basically, first pump pulse demagnetized them, 
and second pump pulse demagnetized them as well. And this gave us contribution with a negative sign here in case of electric dipole. Uh, uh, contribution. So we wanted to get rid of this in order to be exclusively sensitive only to ferromagnetic nuclei which appeared after the pump one. We performed measurements as a function of magnetic field and what we plot here, plot difference uh, measurements in magnetic field, uh, certain magnetic field, let's call it X, minus a measurement in a very small magnetic field, 0.1 kilohertz which will not affect on this uh, time scale, this small magnetic field will not affect spin dynamics. So basically what we do, we exclude those nuclei that had enough time to be oriented in this very small magnetic field, and these nuclei, these are nuclei which were existing in the medium already before pump one. And you can see here very slow dynamics, and uh, Dynamics depends on temperature, oh, sorry, on, on magnetic field and on temperature as well, uh, but was the most important here on the magnetic field, and then it, it increases with magnetic field, it becomes faster and faster. Then, what it was the most surprising for us here, that if you zoom in here at the short time scale, there's a quite a latency period of 20 picoseconds when this, uh, when the, the nuclei generated by uh, first pump in iron rhodium do not emit terahertz radiation at all. So there is no terahertz emission up to 20 picoseconds. And uh, so that means the there is no emissivity. So that you can imagine like there is a pump, one come, uh, they're coming to the sample, does something with the sample, goes whatever changes uh, transition, structural transition whatsoever, but the nuclei start to emit terahertz radiation, it means they become ferromagnetic only after 20 picoseconds. Then there is a slope here again, and this slope uh, linearly depends on the applied magnetic field. So it takes 10 to 20 picoseconds to nucleate a ferromagnetic domain in iron rhodium. So this was, that is a conclusion that we can draw from this measurement. And actually we can build up now the picture, the whole picture of what's going on, and resolve all the controversies that were in the fields up to now uh, when we talk about physics of um, phase transition in iron rhodium. Here we have femtosecond excitation and electron phonon interaction uh, in lattice interaction and cooling down. This is the time scale, one picosecond, 10 picoseconds, 100 picoseconds, one nanosecond. So what we do with femtosecond laser excitation, we induce hot electrons. And uh, as a result, we, we produce, uh, we pump a lot of energy into the system. And we can, pro we can uh, launch two kinds of processes. Those ferromagnetic nuclei, which were already present in the medium before the excitation, they will expand. This expansion can be fast, uh, it's on time scale of, of one per second. And as a result of it, we can see terahertz emission uh, from a single pulse uh, in the medium. Uh, there is also another process. Uh, you pump antiferromagnetic state, purely antiferromagnetic state. You generate many nuclei. Nuclei will have random magnetizations, and they will uh, start align their magnetizations in the applied magnetic field on a time scale of one p uh, one hundred picosecond. And uh, uh, that's at this time scale of 100, 100 picosecond is given by the time characteristic time of spin precession in this field. So it takes of about 10, 20 picoseconds to generate ferromagnetism, and it takes 100 picoseconds in this field to align magnetization in this field. So basically, this is the answer which we can give now about the physics uh, of uh, phase transition in iron rhodium. But the next, uh, uh, next uh, question that we got, uh, having High Field Magnetic Laboratory next uh, door uh, uh, in, in Nijmegen, so that's a laboratory for high magnetic fields, the uh, laboratory Amy, uh, able, which is able to generate magnetic fields up to 38 Tesla just across the street from, uh, from our building. Well, here we have fields 0.1 Tesla. What we have if we apply fields of 30 Tesla? Up. So that's uh, if the fields are 30 Tesla, 
will it will be will we be able to push the speed of phase transition to peak a second or even probably to sub peak a second time scale what will happen in this case well, again we can uh, uh, look now at the data which we have uh, already from uh, from our colleagues from previous studies that they saw that at very low fields uh, my uh, structural transition occurs on time scale of 10 picoseconds and my net optical effect changes on time scale of 30 picosecond. But if you increase field, like on, in this experiment, you can make this increase faster and faster. So as you can see here that the field that they applied, the way I've, uh, actually, uh, I, I don't see it. Where below, yes, they were just one Tesla. Now we want to, make, to increase the field at least by a factor of 10 what will we have in this case. So spin dynamics in high magnetic fields this is the last part. And here I, I'm, uh, I would like to show you, uh, can, can be proud of, we can be proud of this uh, setup. I would like to show you uh, a setup for time resolved measurements in magnetic fields up to 38 Tesla. It's a, uh, so this, there is a question from Ivan. Uh, is this dynamics unique for this specific material? If yes, why? So which dynamics, uh, Ivan? Uh, uh, which in particular? No? Why you may switch on your microphone. Yes, this one at the slides. Uh, you mean the temp, the, the increase, the, uh, the acceleration of spin dynamics in magnetic fields? Or or oh, magnetostructural transition. Yeah, sorry, I, I was struggling with the microphone. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the increase of... Um... Uh, if, if you mean acceleration of spin... So, yeah, yeah, acceleration of spin dynamics. Oh, it's very general. It's uh, uh, just Larmor precession uh, accelerates in applied magnetic fields and ferromagnetic resonance uh, increases frequency in applied magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. And here the same. So basically, all uh, the clock goes faster in magnetism if you apply magnetic field. That's why we do this. Okay. Yeah. Huh? Thank you. But you're right. There are uh, some modes in, uh, like in anti-ferromagnet, anti-ferromagnetic resonance, mm -hmm. is also sensitive to the applied magnetic field. But the field should be stronger than the exchange interaction. So in this case, sometimes uh, some modes of magnetic resonance can be insensitive uh, to the applied magnetic field because it's too small. But in principle, in general, magnetic field does change the frequency of magnetic resonance. Hmm? So uh, does this time scale difference uh, relate somehow to the di uh, to different results obtained from uh, optical and X-ray measurements? Now this was. Uh, so you see here in optical measurements, they apply very small field and they claimed the first place uh, ultra fast change of the magnetization, uh, which can be observed only if you apply magnetic field. So if you uh, apply, uh, if you uh, see speak a second change of magnetization, you have to have uh, 30 Tesla. They didn't have 30 Tesla here. They had uh, 300 times less, uh, uh, 300 times low fields. Uh, so this ultra fast change cannot be explained by a uh, difference in field, and difference in field could be explained in these measurements uh, only in the time uh, uh, could explain uh, uh, difference in the rise time on the time scale of 100 picoseconds. So, like if you have if you have a uh, nuclear set applied, so you see the dynamics and time scale of. Uh, 30 picoseconds, and if you have uh, the set applied, then the dynamics, so this uh, increase, you may even not see this properly on this time scale. And it's, it's faster, but it's not uh, uh, strikingly fast. Yeah, so, but it's all the ch changes are happening here on the time scale of 100 picoseconds. Yes. So high magnetic fields. We have this unique setup for time resolved measurements in 38 Tesla. This is world uh, record for time resolved measurements. Uh, and uh, good thing is that this setup is available for external users. So if you have good idea for 38 Tesla, you are welcome to submit proposal to High Field Magnetic Laboratory, and then we'll have a chance uh, to work together on your on your idea. 
So that's what uh, what we performed. We first uh, we measured planet optical care effects, not our heart's emission anymore, only care effects. We are uh, at the moment uh, not that rich in, uh, cho in the choice of, uh, of the experimental techniques there. It's magnetic optical care effects and maybe Faraday effects. Uh, so we apply magnetic field perpendicular to the sample and measured care rotation upon reflection from the sample. So what we see here that it doesn't matter whether you increase temperature at fixed fields or you increase magnetic field at fixed temperature, you can trigger phase transition in both cases. So 25, the magnetic field with a strength of about 25 Tesla is already strong enough to launch phase transition. So ferromagnetism and iron rhodium can be induced by both temperature increase and magnetic field. So very similarly, if you think of, for instance, uh, boiling of water, and you imagine phase diagram for, uh, on the, not even boiling of water, just phase diagram for water, you do not talk only about temperature, you talk about pressure as well. And in the phase diagram, you have pressure, temperature, and the state of water. Here, the phase diagram, we have, uh, instead of pressure and temperature, we have magnetic field temperature, and then magnetic state of iron rhodium. So the phase transition can be triggered, uh, as I said, either by magnetic field or temperature. And uh, despite the fact that we can induce phase transition by magnetic field, we saw practically no influence on uh, the speed of the process, the speed of phase transition. So here it's we show... Excuse me. Yes. Before you go on, we have a question from Johan. Hmm? Yes. Sorry, it's, it's fine. Just continue. Okay. okay. Yeah. Then we have another question from Sasha. Okay. Uh, yes, sorry for interrupting, but uh, if you apply a magnetic field, does the uh, temperature of transition, uh, equilibrium transition change? Yes, yeah, yeah. So it's a phase diagram. It's the same like you change pressure at the temperature of, uh, of, bo of fusion of water uh, of, will change. Okay, thanks. Yes. And uh, if you now look at the ultra fast time scale, so here we show reflectivity with uh, a black uh, dots and uh, care rotation with red dots. We first start with low field, 4 Kelvin. So reflectivity changes, but it changes fast, so most likely it's a contribution from uh, the electrons, so at least it was explained like this. We hardly see any change in the care rotation. Now, there is a very, uh, very small con contribution to the reflectivity, which increases slowly. And the care rotation appears, and then at the very high fields, 25 Tesla, rotation and the care, uh, care rotation and the reflectivity go in step one with another. So here again, we can, we can go to high temperatures, we see phase transition, uh, we can trigger phase transition at already 20 Tesla, Again, it goes in step. Uh, it, uh, structural changes go in step with magnetic changes. And we go to higher temperature, and again, magnetic changes become faster and faster, never faster than the structural changes. So basically, high magnetic field ferromagnetism is induced as fast as the structural changes, but never faster than the latter. So the time required for the structural changes is the limit. So I think uh, that's what I announced uh, at the beginning of the talk uh, wh while resolving chicken and neck problem, uh, while well, we actually arrived to chicken neck problem, <laughs> to the answer of chicken and neck problem. There is no answer what was the first, what was the second. These two transitions go together. So evolution of chicken and egg uh, goes uh, together. So they are not, they cannot be separated. Uh, so the conclusions. And the second laser pulse trigger magnetic structural phase transition from antiferromagnetic to ferromagnetic state. So it was, uh, it was known of before, of course, it was a part uh, that I put uh, in the introduction. Uh, the magnetic uh, changes can be probed using magneto-optical care effect or terahertz emission. Structural changes can be monitored using reflectivity. This is again a summary of what we uh, knew before we started the measurements. Uh, coexistence of phases is a key feature first of the phase transitions. It's, a, it's also something that we knew, but what was not realized that it has to be taken into account when you do stroboscopic measurements. You shouldn't expect any hysteresis, and you should do something to guarantee that uh, you, uh, you, 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 you start, you, you 
broke the very same path. So in our case, though, it was double pump uh, experiment. Excitation of iron rhodium with femtosecond pulses generates nuclei of ferromagnetic phase. That's known. And what we show that the nuclei are established only in 10, 20 picoseconds after the excitation. People claim this, uh, came with this hypothesis already earlier uh, doing X-ray measurements, and now we confirm this with terahertz and explain where the terahertz emission comes from. So structural changes estimated from the reflectivity also occur on the time scale of 10 picoseconds, and then means the characteristic time roughly three picoseconds. And as I said, this time scale is it can be it can be uh, it can vary from sample to sample because it's defined by the thickness of the uh, uh, sample divided by the speed of the sound in the material. Uh, and nuclei expand with the speed defined by the applied magnetic field. However, already five Tesla, the characteristic time of the phase transition reaches the limit of three picoseconds. Characteristic time of structural uh, changes. And third increase of the field does not accelerate the phase transition any further. At the end, I would like to thank uh, a big team from uh, Nijmegen, uh, also from, uh, from our uh, laboratory, NHFML. And, uh, oh yeah, it's a copy paste that didn't work properly. So it's a team from uh, San Diego and Professor Zvezdin who uh, supports us with theory. So we are the more theory will come. So it's not yet, it uh, uh, was not yet in this presentation, but we are preparing, uh, so to say, our view on chicken and egg problem in magnetism. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Alexei. Um, so before we thank the speaker, we can, so we are open for questions. Um, please feel free to ask them in the chat or raise your hands, please. Um, so before we wait, I would like to ask you, uh, Alexei, what is the, so how precise do you measure those 20 picoseconds? Uh, so what is the reference and how you, uh, so this delay uh, when you, have, you begin to obtain the signal, uh, so how, how precise is it measured? So this is basically here, the answer yeah. is here. So you uh, measure emissivity, then you see that the slope changes. So here it's zero and then you, you can, uh, well, you can play tricks like uh, with the feet, so with uh, calculating average uh, terahertz emissivity, but then we calculate when emissivity is not zero, then uh, and that it, it's imp also important, it depends linearly on the applied magnetic field. Okay. So basically, it's a change of the slope here. So we try to, uh, to emphasize this here. The change of the slope, and the dependence is for us as a, a signature of, uh, of the latency. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alexandra? Oh, no, sorry. I don't have any more questions. Sorry. Uh, okay, then Johan? Uh, can you go to the slide where there is this uh, FISREF V paper, first author of Bargman? Yes, yeah. So in, in that slide, there seems to be some oscillations in the data. Yes. In these blue curves. Is there any interpretation of that? Yeah, it's a ferromagnetic resonance. And uh, most likely it's a ferromagnetic... Re uh, also, these are simulations. Uh, well... It could be ferromagnetic resonance in nuclei which were already present in the medium, or it is ferromagnetic resonance. Uh, we, we have to look at the details of simulations here. I tend to think that this is ferromagnetic resonance in the, in the nuclei which were already present in the, uh, in the medium before the pump. Okay. Ah, yeah. uh, we should look what the simulations do here, but at the end it's ferromagnetic resonance in, uh, in ferromagnetic uh, parts of iron rhodium. Okay, thank you very much. And, and more general question about the experimental technique. When, when you, you always say that you dominantly probe the lattice if you um, look at your resistivity. Uh, why is it only lattice and not also electrons? Well, it is electrons. Uh, I think nice explanation what you actually probe uh, was uh, given in the very first uh, work on uh, iron on dynamics in iron rhodium. So this paper of, um, let me show you here. So this is what you observe in reflectivity. And it consists of two contributions, one from electrons, this black part, and one from the lattice. Ah, I see. 
Ah, so they were able to distinguish them. Yes. I see, I see. But in another just simple question, is, any, is there any study on just demagnetization within the antiferromagnetic phase? Demagnetization like, within antiferromagnetic state? No. I so mean, uh, in this particular material or in general? No, in this particular material. No, not, no, not. So because as, as I said, uh, the, uh, we, I think our work is the first work where we paid attention to what we probe actually. Uh, that is most, uh, all the works before they just performed pump probe, but if you perform pump probe in the vicinity of first order phase transition, we don't, we, you, you don't know, you know what you pump, but you, you don't know what you probe. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I just was wondering, in principle, antiferromagnets can, of course, decay very fast. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, uh, I don't know if that is relevant, this decay of the ordered moment in uh, the phase transition. It doesn't seem to be so, but uh, it would still be, be still interesting to know. And I would expect that, in principle, with biofinance, you can detect that. Yes, it should be possible, I think. Uh, and it's also a very interesting question to look at the kinetics of transition from antiferromagnetic state to paramagnetic state when you pump really hard, mm -hmm. or to ferromagnetic state. So I assume yes. that the destroying yeah. antiferromagnetism is easier than, than build up ferromagnetism. Exactly, exactly. I would say if you first destroy antiferromagnetism, maybe you can do this transition faster, or yes. create the ferromagnetic state after that faster. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Colleagues, do we have any more questions? Um, so, okay. If not, so I, I, I suggest that we uh, thank the speaker with applause. If you want to join us, please switch on your microphones. While you are doing so, I would like to say uh, that uh, the video of the seminar will be uh, available uh, at our YouTube channel. And you can also follow our events on our website and, the, uh, and subscribe to our mailing list below the video. So, Alexey, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. It was my pleasure. Uh, so, so, before we, so we go away, I would like to announce the next topical seminar that will be held uh, uh, next Friday at 10 a.m. St. Petersburg time as usually. So, it will be given by uh, Dr. Andrei Bogdanov from our department at Akmo University. He will be talking about our joint work on uh, demultiplexing and steering of guided light with dielectric antennas. So, you're welcome. Alexei, thanks again. Yes, thank you. Okay.